Hello, and welcome back to the Write Project podcast, where we discuss writing, publishing, and everything books. Today's a special episode. We're answering the questions made by you, the listeners. We've got four amazing talents from the writing industry on the line. We have Kelly Power, the vice president of Wannell. We have Chelsea B., author of London Calling. We have John Dobbin, winner of the 48-hour writing marathon. And we have Helen Escott, whose second book, Operation Wormwood, debuts in August from Flanker Press. Okay, without further ado, let's just get started. What's your favorite unknown book? Like a book that you think you love, but nobody else even knows about. So mine is a book called Carrots by Colleen Helm, which is an indie book that I discovered through just a free promotion where they were sending out copies of the book, and I adored it. There's Mm -hmm. ten books in this series right now. I've read them all. It's just a lady who is a detective, and in the first book, she is going to the grocery store to get some carrots, and so because she's making something and she didn't have carrots she slips and hits her head and from striking her head gains psychic powers and uses those powers to start a detective agency where she starts working for people and she like can use it to mimic the skills of a detective yeah because she actually can hear their thoughts and it's amazing and it's quirky and it's like what's gonna happen next because it doesn't fit any kind of regular nut structure but it's wonderful love it can't recommend it enough All right, we've got Helen Escott on the line. She's the author of the book Operation Wormwood, coming out from Flanker Press. What do you think, Helen? Nothing comes to mind right away. I tend to read all over the place. I'll just go in and I'll I'll get whatever book that kind of I'm in the mood for at the time. And like I said, I like biographies. I really love reading about people. But I love Dan Brown. Yeah. And and I love reading his books. I really look forward to his books coming out. I love him. I hate his dialogue. I, I wish he had at some point in his life heard another human speak so that he could know what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. I have, I, and you know what? And I kind of have this dream as a writer. I would love to write a book with Dan Brown. I would love for him to have Robert Langdon meet my character, yeah, you know, good, Serge man. Myra, and get them to solve a crime together. That's that kind of like fit. my, uh, that's that's my writer pornography dream. Yep, yep, that's fair. Okay, well, we've got Chelsea B. on the line. She wrote London Calling from Engine Books. What do you think there, Chelsea? Um, I have two that I really, really love. One is a horror novella. It's called Disquiet by Julia Lee, and it's very, I mean, the title Disquiet really sums up the atmosphere very well. And it's not horror in the fact that it's like a creature feature or anything. It's just the character's internal struggles of losing a child. And the doctor kind of says, you know, sometimes mothers who have a stillborn baby find some closure in spending some time with that child in the hospital. She takes the child out of the hospital and keeps it in her freezer for an extended period of time. And it is horrifying and real and so good and uh julia lee in general is very underrated she's also a filmmaker she did a film called sleeping beauty very adult but very raw and very good there's also an author that i think is underrated libra bray she she's most known for the great and terrible beauty series which did receive some um i've heard of it claim yeah yeah. it's 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 pretty well known that series her book going bovine i recommend to everybody because it's hilarious it's about a guy, a teenager. It's it's young adult. It's about a teenager who escapes from the hospital when he has mad cow disease and he like hallucinates and he goes on this journey with his friend who also escaped from the hospital and they have they get a garden gnome that's um Odin, like the Norse god. And then they just go on an adventure throughout America. It's hilarious. But you okay. don't know if he's hallucinating everything. It's so good. Okay. Yeah. It's really funny. <laughs> Sounds it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called going both. <laughs> All that's right. The laughing out because that's no. embarrassing, but it's hilarious. The laughing's got to stay in. That's amazing. Okay. Okay. We've got John Dobbin on the line, winner of the forty-eight hour writing marathon. What do you think, John? Um, I think the Robert E. Howard books on Conan, all of his short stories. I don't think many people are aware of that. Um, anymore like there was a time yeah. when it was all that was known but it, yeah for sure uh, but i don't think like people when they say conan they think of the arnold schwarzenegger movie well you not know? only that but it was too pulpy to be in school yeah. and now it's too 
old to be current, so that yeah. stuff kind of falls away. When really, I think we could. There could be a pulp class. We could do oh, that. Oh, for sure. It's it's poetry is what it is. He, he just paints pictures for you. What's the first book that got you really interested in reading? All right. Well, we've got Kelly Power on the line from Wannell. What do you think, Kelly? When I was in my primary school, we had a great little library, and I picked up this book one time called The Hotel Cat, and it was a novel-ish type of book. I mean, it wouldn't have been a terribly big novel. I couldn't have been more than probably eight at the time, so it wasn't overly complex, but I remember devouring that book, and I can't tell you why. You ate it? Yes, I ate it. Uh, It tasted a little moldy. Okay. I loved that book, and I obviously loved it, because I remember to this day that I read that book, and I absolutely loved it, and it was just about a cat living in a hotel with other people and animals, and some thing happens toward the end of the book, and the cat rescues people, and... I just, I don't know, I found it, I mean, there are some fantastical elements in that. Maybe I was just always destined to be reading that kind of, of fiction, because I probably have a, a leaning toward it even today. Oh. Can I give you a different answer to that question? Yes. Or an alternative answer to that? Okay. Because it's not one I would have read. There's a book called Our Universe, and it was produced in the 70s by National Geographic, and I remember it had the spaceship on the cover, the stars, so it's a book about different elements of the universe, and it had these vibrant colors on the glossy pages. I mean, as a kid, to turn those pages was absolutely amazing, but they they had concept drawings of what life might look like on all of our different planets in the solar system, all these fantastical creatures and plant life that would be there. And when they had, when they did the planet descriptions, they had an illustration of the god that was associated with that particular planet so you know a drawing of mars and i i remembered that book so well as a kid i was talking to my brother about it about i don't know six months ago and he remembered it and he's eight years younger than me so that book would have been in tatters by the time he saw it so it's it's a book with these this massive depth of impression about not just itself as a book to engage you but as it makes you think about and opens up your imagination to things so i went online and i bought two used copies and i have one for me now and i gave one to my brother for his birthday and i could not be more excited Awesome. (laughs) I have a follow-up question. If the planets were discovered today, like if we were just now discovering the other members of our solar system, would they all be named after Harry Potter characters? (laughs) I would say I'm not sure, but I can definitely say that they would have the kind of gender and ethnic diversity that's reflected in the characters that J.K. Rowling created. Yeah, I can tell you um, I was looking up animals and insects that were discovered last year, and one is the Gryffindor spider because mm. it actually is a new breed of spider they've discovered, and the the back of it, like that's usually very round, it looks like a sorting hat. It looks <gasps> just like it. So it, even the Latin term for it is Gryffindorius something. Like it's love it. So we can already see that no, absolutely, they are just naming stuff after Harry Potter now. Just like back in the day, it was Greek mythology. Yeah, it's our our mod- our, our modern myths, our mo- modern mythological heroes. Okay, <laughs> but that's what I that's what I say. I mean, th- those characters are mythologized to a. A great degree, I think, in in those books. So, yeah, I'm, I stand by that. Okay. What do you think, Helen? I think for me, it would be the Dick and Jane books. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I go back that far. <laughs> All right. What do you think, Chelsea? Nancy Drew and the Secret of the Old Clock, definitely, 100%. So many people have answered Nancy Drew. I love it because it's good, obviously. Yeah. But when I was in the sixth grade, we had, like, you know how during, like, the week before Christmas break or, like, the last week of school, you just do, like, fun stuff? Yeah. We had that. And one of it was, like, dress as your favorite literary character. And I was Nancy Drew from the cover of The Secret of the Old Clock. And I had the green dress. And that's when I was natural blonde. And I had, like, a little magnifying glass. And I thought that I was, like, th- no one understood who I was. No one got it. No. Right? Everyone else was, like, Judy B. Jones or something like you ev- that everyone knew. Shirley Holmes? Judy B. Jones. Shirley Holmes. <laughs> Do you ever watch that show? No. Oh, there was a show on YTV, The Adventures of Shirley Holmes, and she was the spiritual descendant of Sherlock Holmes. Interesting. Yeah. It's that, like, Nancy Drew with me. What do you think, John? My favorite book, I think, was Batman Nightfall. It was when the Batman had been broken by Bane when I was a kid, and they came out with a novelization about Asriel taking over for for Batman. I think I've read that. 
Yeah, and I think it was called Nightfall, and I loved it. I read it multiple times. I was a huge fan of uh, that. That kind of got me in. I was a big comic book reader as a kid. That was my gateway into reading. Yeah. And then my gateway from to transition from comics into novels. Not that I don't still love comics, but yeah. my gateway from that were the adaptations, where, yeah. like, the Christopher Golden was my first real novel that I sought out. Yep. Yeah. Who inspired you to write? What do you think, Helen? I was very lucky in that I was taught by nuns, uh, Sisters of Mercy, and they were very big on educating girls, and it was very important to them to educate girls. And so reading and writing and literature was stressed from kindergarten on up. Not like it is today. It was a very big thing. Penmanship was a very big thing. Yeah. And they wanted you to be well-read. And uh, and then when I went to, uh, I went to Our Lady of Mercy and then went to Holy Heart, same thing. It was a big emphasis on the education of girls. And that came from, I don't know if you realize, but Holy Heart was built by nuns. And those nuns took out a loan from a bank and built that school because there was no real school for girls in St. John's at that time. Oh, wow. And to be educated like this. And they never took a salary for years. They taught for free, and their salary went to paying off the mortgage of Holy Heart. Wow. And they built a school that had a theater. It was the first school with a theater. It was the first school with a grand piano and a music program and a theater program. And then when girls decided they want to go to engineering, there was a nun who actually came in and did engineering so she could go back and teach those classes to those science classes that were needed to girls to become engineers. Wow. So isn't that incredible? So there was such an, you know, when people think of nuns, they think of these, I have a huge nun uh, love for nuns because uh, people think of them as these strict people who, you know, just gave you the strap. Not at all. The nuns that I had were very nice ladies who uh, put a huge emphasis on education because they knew the value that women could bring to the world if they had the right education and that was the whole point of holy heart so when i i was lucky that when i went through it those nuns were still there and they're not there today and of course it's a male female school now but when i went there it was all girls but the nuns put the value in us that we could be anything because i grew up in a generation where your choice was to be a teacher or a nurse or marry well yeah. And that was it. There was no other career for me. What do you think, John? I had a couple of good inspirations to write. In the literary world, it was kind of Lisa Moore was kind of the one that kind of inspired me because she was a local Newfoundland author who was getting national attention, you know? So it was pretty cool for that. And I do enjoy her writing. My father was an English teacher growing up. He's a, he loves to write poetry. He was always writing. He's continuing to write now. And in his retirement, he's writing a bit more now poetry. So that's kind of been an inspiration to me. My friends, uh, Steve Power, for instance, he, his early writing in high school uh, made me, I'm five years younger than him. So made me aspire to be a bit of a writer. Cool. And even now with the writing group that I'm in, um, they inspire me to just keep writing, uh, to keep on track of things and try and do my best as a writer. Cool. Kelly Power on the line from Wannell. Does writing energize you or does it exhaust you? Because I feel like there's a pretty good 50-50 divide between those two things where people start out with energy and then at the end they're just like, they feel like a husk, like this has taken all this out of them. Or people who get that endorphin buzz and they start out slow and like, oh, I need my coffee. And by the end of it, it's like, all right, let's get the day started. I am definitely energized by writing and it is incredibly difficult to start. I am like a bird looking at shiny things when I sit down at the computer. It's like, oh, what's that over there? Oh, what's that over there? I'm distracted. I'm procrastinating. But once I get into it, and especially if I'm content with the progress I've made, I'm really energized by it. Well, it's kind of like a, it's like a bit of a drug, <laughs> if I can say that. Uh, it's just like a hit of something when I'm when I get to a point where I'm content with what I've got and I can stand up and feel like okay, it's like I I've done the most important thing in my day now, and the rest of the day is just gravy. That's nothing. What drugs are like? That's not <laughs> drug. <laughs> Like, that's not what drugs are like. <laughs> Does it depend on the drug? No. You take the 
Yeah. Yeah. What do you think there, Chelsea? Oh, I definitely feel very drained by it, which is also a catch-22 because I write best in the morning. So So your day is just done. Yeah, it's over. Like, it's a write-off at that point. Um, But yeah, I try to write as much as I can in the morning, and I'm like, okay, it's 6 o'clock, and I am just finishing coffee, and I've written 500 words. That's great. But, like, what else is there to do today? There's always stuff to do. I just don't want to do it. Yeah. Laundry piles up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The cat won't stop meowing because yeah. it's been precisely three minutes. Yeah. Yes. Late. <laughs> yes. Yes. What's happening? <laughs> I don't like change. <laughs> Meow. What do you think, John? I think the way I write is really strange um, because I have three kids and I have a full time job and I have a wife, you know, and family life. Um, I think I'm always exhausted because of that. So writing, you, you you kind of exude exhaustion, like yeah, you're that's, like that's a nice thing to say. It, <laughs> you kind of do that. <laughs> you're like you're like, you're a very nice guy, but you kind of have this. I am too tired to smile. You'll have yeah. to trust that I am happy. Uh, well, yeah, that's not. Yeah, I feel tired a lot, but I just fit writing in. I I don't know if I'd say that it energizes me or if it uh, exhausts me. I do know that when I come up with something, like if I'm struggling with how I'm going to move from one point to the next and what I'm writing and I do figure that out that does energize me a bit it gets me pretty stoked but uh I wouldn't say writing in general does either or have you ever had reader's block yeah that's an interesting question um I find that this is actually before I started forcing myself to read a little bit more um I found that I could read a lot for a few months but then I'd get to the point where I'm like hey okay you know, I'm not really interested in doing much reading right now. And so it would take me a while to get over that. And so that was kind of a reader's block. But I've been finding lately that where I have been reading a lot more, that if I get into a book and it's not what I envisioned, I kind of put off reading it. Yep. You know, like I don't want to read it anymore. Yep. And I have to really force myself unwillingly to read it to get through it. I just give up on those books. Unless it's something I need to read for class or yeah. for research for something, it's just gone. Like, like there's a famous author that I've never been able to read one of his books. I've tried multiple times, but um, mm-hmm. William Gibson, yeah, he's famous. He's, he's one of the top, like, when people, you know, think of the hardcore sci-fi people, it's like he's Neuromancer. always... there. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's one of the top... Neuromancer, exactly yeah. that. Cannot do it. And I tried to read that, tried to read its sequels, tried to read something other by him, and I'm just, I don't know what it is about his style. I tried ebook, I tried print, I tried audiobook. I just give up at about three chapters and be like, I could do better things. I managed to get through that, but I, I see what you're saying about it. I don't know what, like, I can handle different styles. I can handle, like, uh, Rendezvous with Rama, like, and I can handle Snow Crash. Yeah. Like, it's, you know. Um, the only book that I've done that with recently was the first of that series of books that Stephen King did with Peter Straub. Okay. Talisman. Um, yeah. I, I did not enjoy that whatsoever. Yeah. Couldn't get past the first couple of chapters. Wow. Had to put it down. Interesting. Which is weird because Stephen King's one of my favorite writers. Which can only lead you to believe that it's either the Straub side of it that you're not liking yeah. or that they're losing something in collaboration. Yeah. For Might sure. be interesting to read something by Straub only and see if you have trouble with it. And then you're like, oh, well, that's what the problem yeah. was for me. Yeah, blame it all on him. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, like, everyone has different tastes. So, I mean, just yeah. because you don't like it. What do you think, Kelly? I have definitely had that. I have found it's periodic and tied to... I can usually tie it to something. An author? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'll just close that book and I'll move right on if it's a particular author. I've, I've tried a few times with William Gibson and... Do not understand. Also, Tolkien, but my my antipathy but toward Tolkien is well documented. Uh, you have a partner in arms there. I'm not a not not a fan of written Tolkien, and I know that that's like a an offense punishable by death. But it's um it's dry. It is dry. Um, I've never even attempted to read Lord of the Rings because I read The Hobbit, and I said that's enough of that. I can't see myself going through three tombs of this after I've done The Hobbit. Now my brother... Tomb is a, it's a great <laughs> term for it because you'll think you're... You, you, will, you will see through time and think you're dead while you're reading <laughs> Tolkien. 
<laughs> my my brain is dying a slow death over dwarfish songs, and yeah, I, I can't. Oh, no, no, there is one point in it where you have watched. Okay, you know in the movies mm. that point where okay, Merry and Pippin have you have helped the trees defeat. Uh, Saruman, spoilers, yes. and then Legolas and Gimli come and you meet them and they just go, what have you two been up to and this and that kind of thing. That's all very well and good in the movie. In the book, you read both plot lines. Like, you read Gimli's plot and then you read Legolas's plot and then you read Merry and Pippin's plot and then when they all hook up, instead of, like, cutting back and forth, like, cutting away and being like, oh, they filled each other in, no, you're subjected to four and a half pages where they recap everything you just read. Like, it violates the basic principle of writing, which is don't give the reader the same information twice, and just does it ad nauseum. And I'm like, what are you thinking? Was it last year you did the... Uh, Lit Wars. Yeah, the Lit Wars. Which I won. <laughs> Is that subjective or objective? That is, there was audience applause stating that I lost, but <laughs> that audience was biased. It was a sci-fi convention. You knew in your heart that you would actually win. I did. I so, did. have I had the reading uh, doldrums? I've definitely had that. Uh, I've had it um, typically when I've been forced to be reading other things that I don't want to read so it leaves me no time to read the things I want to read. Like, doing my master's was like that. But when I did finally crack that, doing my master's, it's when I read the whole Harry Potter series. So once you pierce the wall, it's good. And I'm actually on a reading jag right now, so it's, it's unusual. I feel like I'm coming off a, a reading downtime straight into this period of voracious consumption of books. Interesting. I, I feel like last year, the last two years were big voracious consumption years for me. Like in addition to getting a lot of writing done, I think in 2017, I read 300 novels. Well, you had yourself sort of out there saying you were trying to get through a lot. Yeah, a ton yeah. of books that, that particular year. But so would you have done all those books if you hadn't set that challenge yourself? I can't yourself? now. I've got too much on the go with the with the company. Like, there's just too much. I've been struggling to get through one that I'm excited to read. I'm like, the hell an escot. Oh, what are you reading right now? Are you reading it? Is there anything you're reading at the moment? Right now, for the last six weeks, I've been just focusing on my own book and trying to get that ready and, and come up with ideas for artwork and editing and things. You're busy right now. But I'm co I'm constantly reading and I've got like six books beside my bed that I got for Christmas and I'm just getting through them and um, what I just finished reading was Amy Schumer's biography actually. <laughs> I, I read that. I love that actually. Yeah, she's you know she's real. And That's the uh, the girl with the lower back tattoo. Yeah, that yep. one. And uh, and she's real, and I like that, and I and I love comedy because even though this book is kind of dark, I still write. I'm funny like that. The blog, and it's yep. a funny look at life, and uh, it kind of makes you laugh and make you think. And and I think reading her book was kind of inspirational for me. I think it's important to have humor to offset the dark darker aspects of our lives yeah and i think what i like about her is i ever to ever read the book i realized you know what if we were in high school together we would have been friends but i would have been the one stuck in detention while she would have got away with it yeah <laughs> john i've picked up a bunch of these really cheesy old western books and this one's actually from like 1991 it's a george or gregory sheriff or sheriff's book and i it's a book that has two books in it two short books and one was Shadow Valley, that, that's the first part of it, I finished that. And next is Fort Vengeance, I just started on Fort, Fort Vengeance. Fort Vengeance, yeah. Okay. How do you select the names of your characters? What do you think, Kelly? That's a really interesting question because I've put a lot of thought into that. And what I find is the first time I go through first drafts of things, I'll just kind of let the name be whatever comes into my head, which is usually the name of somebody I know because those names come most easily. And recognizing that that was both very limiting, because I don't know that many people, and not terribly helpful, I've gotten baby name books out from the library. Yep. And the other day, I asked my dad to bring me over an old phone book for Newfoundland. Yes. So anything that's last name oriented for pieces I write based in Newfoundland, and I mean, obviously, last names in our phone book will apply to other places as well. But specifically, if I'm working in Newfoundland, um, working on Newfoundland pieces, the phone book for last names. I am famous for just taking one album 
and then another album and picking a random producer from that album and using their first name and a random producer from another album and using their second name. Fantastic. And just being like, there you go. And what I find really interesting is that, because there are authors, I'm sure, who look through, I know, for instance, my co-author on Infinity goes through and every name has, like, significance. Like, she figures out where she wants to go with that character and if they're secretly a princess, then they're going to be named Sarah because Sarah means princess. You right. know what I mean? And that, not that exactly, but that sort of thinking where it's like the name is reflective. Mm -hmm. What I find really hilarious is the amount of times I've picked names at random to go on a baby names database afterwards and go, no, this was actually correct. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there's a lead character. Uh, Alex in one of my books, uh, Alexander, and turns out Alexander means hero of the people. And I'm like, oh, what a good name for a protagonist. That worked all right. Well, I've, I do find that it's, like, I tried the, the online databases for baby names because I mean, you don't need a book from the library. But I, I found that the sort of alphabetical way of having to go through them is like, I don't like that. I like That's why I get the book. Because yeah. I, I like to be able to flick open too. Because there is something, I don't necessarily go for the meaning of the name. You know they do print books of baby names, right? Yeah, that's what I, mean. I get yeah. that from the library. That's what I'll oh, get, okay. the, the print book from the library. So I, I don't go for the meaning of the name. But I don't like it to be totally random. There'll be something that will happen when I see a name and I say it even maybe. And it's like... That feels right for that character. So it's a feeling thing, whatever whatever way that plays itself out. And that's why I need the ability to browse. Because, like, mm, no, I'm feeling this is like a hard consonant name. And then I go to that. What is your favorite character name that you didn't come up with? Like, a from a novel. Like, just a name of a character. It's like, oh, yes, that. That's a good question. Can I give you mine? Yes. It's from a uh, Neil Stevenson novel called Snow Crash. Love that book. Can't recommend it enough. The hero protagonist's name is Hero Protagonist. Like, first name <laughs> H-I-R-O, second name Protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just and it's like, not at all on the nose. No. I mean, that that person could have any role in that book. Uh, yes. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> and I remember starting the book and going, no. Like, I almost put it down. I was like, no, you can't be serious. It's an amazing book. And you, you forget the character's name a few times. And they come back and remind you. It's like, what's your name? Protagonist. What protagonist? Hero protagonist? No, really, what's your name, sir? <laughs> like, <laughs> it is hero protagonist. Yeah. I actually don't have a good answer for that. Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't say. You can't top hero protagonist. I mean, there's, there is no topping that in, in any case. That's the best. <laughs> oh, my. What do you think there, Chelsea? Oh, of characters? I love naming characters. That's probably my favorite part of writing. So baby naming websites help. In London Calling, there are so many different Shakespearean references that the characters, either every character name or personality were inspired by a Shakespeare character. So I was in between things that could also realistically be used in real life. So for her name, it was between Viola and Olivia, and his was between Duncan and Malcolm. And those are just the two that I picked. What do you think, John? That is interesting. With the Western Weird West, I actually just l came up with a list myself of names that sounded like they came from the Wild West, you know? Okay. But the novel that I'm working on now, I kind of wanted to have a bunch of different cultures represented by different cultures within the book itself. So I searched up online some uh, some names, and each of the names I chose had a meaning attached to them, and I chose that for each character based on the meaning of the name. Okay, so you're picking names based on almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, Hero like I have, I have one character who has three or four different names in the book based on the people he's interacting with. I see. And uh, one of his names means outsider. Okay. Uh, when he's acting in one part of the world, but when he goes to another part of the world, it means warrior. He cha His name changes, what they call him. Interesting. So yeah, like it kind of goes like that. All right. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to call in and answer those questions. You can pick up London Calling in stores now if you want to check out Chelsea B's work. Operation Wormwood by Helen Escott will be available in 
August. You can read John Dobbins' short stories in Chillers from the Rock, available now. And if you have any interest in writing whatsoever, please go online to wannell.ca, that's W-A-N-L dot C-A, and sign up. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.